it's great to be Norm Summer in my library. This is the first two that we will have helped us in here, and we're grateful to the Norm Summer in library staff for their allowing us to be in this space this afternoon. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the North Cut Lecture. Before I introduce our lecture and our lecturer, I'd like to make two quick announcements. One is that in addition to the lecture, Dr. Shaw will be available tonight at 7.15 for a time of dialogue for those who are interested. And the dialogue session will be held downstairs in the seminar room in this same building. Those of you who are involved, involved in the church music forum uh, need to see Dr. Music to make sure that you register your attendance uh, for this event. Since its inception in 1985, the North Coast Lecture Series has become an integral part of the academic and spiritual life of the Baylor University School of Music. Designed to bring nationally and internationally known scholars in music to Baylor University, the North Cut Lecture Series is made possible through an endowment given by the Grand and Cassandra North Cut of Longview. Both the North Cuts are Baylor graduates and they are valued friends of the School of Music. They are both here today and we'd like to recognize you. In addition to uh, Cassandra and Lorraine, their uh, children are also here. Uh, their um, son, Gordon, and his wife, Virginia, and their daughter, Conlon, who is a senior, are also here, and they are right here on the second row. Also, Mark Newton, who has just begun, uh, their son-in-law, Mark Newton, has just begun a position here at Baylor. Uh, their daughter, Amelia, and uh, their daughter, Adeline, who's a freshman, is here. So we have Welcome to all of you. We're so glad you're here. And now I'll introduce our lecturer. Carl Schalk is a distinguished professor of music emeritus at Concordia University, Chicago, where he taught from 1965 to 1994. He received his undergraduate education at Concordia Teachers College, and he holds advanced degrees from the Eastman School of Music and from Concordia Seminary in St. Louis, Missouri. He was named a Fellow of the Hymn Society of the United States and Canada. In 1992, and an honorary life member of the Association of Church Musicians, Lutheran Association of Church Musicians, in 1995. He was elected Distinguished Professor of Music at Concordia Seminary in 1993, and in 1999, he received the prestigious Wittenberg Award from the Lutheran Institute in Washington, D.C. In 2002, he received the Distinguished Composer Award from the American Guild of Organists. He has also served as lead consultant for celebrating the musical heritage of the Lutheran Church, as editor of music for the Radio Growth Broadcast of the International Lutheran Hour, as editor of Church Music, and he served as a member of the committee which prepared the Lutheran Book of Worship in 1978. Schalk's numerous choral compositions and hymn settings for congregation and use are widely used in many denominations. His 100 original hymn tunes and carols can be found in over 30 denominational hymnals in a number of countries. His publications are numerous and wide-ranging, and the full list can be found in your program. His many articles and reviews have appeared in such journals as Christian Century and many others. Carl Schock is married to Noelle Donato Roeder. They have three children and four grandchildren. It is our pleasure to welcome Dr. Paul Shaw as a 2014 North Cut lecturer. Thank you. So 
that it is the church's song that we're talking about. Uh, we hear a lot of talk about the congregational song, the people's song, and that's all well and good. But before it is any of those, it is the church's song. And it is the church's song that we're really talking about. Uh, we could say it in this way. In the preface to the service of Holy Communion in the Mass, you find the words leading up to the singing of the Santos, which say, uh, Therefore, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God of Sabbath, and so on. And I think many congregations, uh, hearing those words, uh, say, Here we are at St. John's by the gas station, and uh, isn't it nice? that as we sing our praises, the angels and archangels are singing along with us. And I think that's just backwards. Because here at St. John's by the gas station, or wherever you are, it's you who are singing along with the angels and archangels. Because the song of the church is, is a song that has been sung long before we were on the scene and will continue to be sung long after we are gone, and that we, in the brief time that is allowed to us, are privileged to join in that song with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven. So I think if we think of it in those terms, it puts it in a little different perspective. We are joining together with the whole of the heavenly host in singing praises to God. Now, if one were to say, where in in Holy Scripture is the first example of a song where we actually are given the words. I think one could argue that you find it in Exodus chapter 15, where after the uh, children of Israel have escaped from Pharaoh in, in Egypt, they've gone through the, through the wet Red Sea, and they come out on dry land, and Scripture says, and Miriam and all the women went out with timbrels and sang this song to the Lord. And then it tells you what the words are. And the words are, the horse of his rider he has thrown into the sea. Well, what's that all about? Uh, well, what that, is, what that text is doing is they were singing praises to God who had acted to save them. And that's a good way to start in describing what the song of the church is. It's the song of praise to the God who acts to save us. And if you go throughout the whole Old Testament, and since we are getting a Cliff Notes version of that today, uh, if you fasten on the book of Psalms, you would see that the, the Psalms, which talk often about praising God, it's almost always in connection with God's action to save. If you look at the 150th Psalm, where you list every conceivable instrument that is to praise God, uh, praising upon this instrument, praising upon that instrument, and at the end of all those instruments it says, praise Him for His mighty acts. That's what we are praising God. Praise Him for His mighty acts. And it's interesting to me that I think it's not a coincidence that the, the the uh, psalm that the Christian church generally has chosen as the psalm to be sung on the central day of its year, which is the Easter celebration, is Psalm 118, which includes the phrase, on this day the Lord has acted. And so we see throughout the whole Old Testament this development of this narrative of how God has saved his and then, with the beginning of the New Testament, God sends His Son into the world to fulfill the law for us, to, to suffer, die on the cross, to be raised again by the glory of the Father. He ascends to heaven, and where He reigns until He comes again on the last day to judge the earth and take all believers in Him to eternal life in heaven. That is the narrative that's developed throughout the Bible. If you look at the sermons of Paul when he goes out on his missionary journeys, that's the story 
that he presents to the people. And so praise and that story of that narration of salvation history are always linked together. Uh, I'll give you uh, one example uh, from a little later. Uh, when you get to the, the fifth, sixth century, you have the famous hymn by the Nantes Fortunatus, Sing my tongue the glorious battle, sing the ending of the fray. Now above the cross, the trophy, sound the loud triumphant lay. And what is that loud triumphant lay? Tell how Christ, the world's redeemer, as a victim, won the day. So Christians are encouraged in that hymn to sing of Christ who, as a victim, won the day. And that is the hymn which the church generally has appointed to be sung on the holidays. Good Friday, when we concentrate on the story of Christ's suffering and death. And this psalm from the 6th century holds up the promise that while we are contemplating that story, we look ahead because we know how it turns out. Sing my tongue of the glorious battle, sing the ending of the fray. Tell us how the battle turns out. Now above the cross, the trophy, sound the loud cry of the play, tell how Christ, the world's redeemer, as a victim, won the day. In our culture, victims are not winners. Victims are generally losers. That's the way we think of it. Christ was the victim, but he was also the winner because he won the day. And how appropriate that is that on Good Friday, when we think about Christ's suffering and death, we think ahead a few days because we know how the story turns out. It's not that we come to church on Good Friday and we think about Christ's suffering death and then say, we go home now because we have to come back to find out how it turns out. We won't know for two days, but we know how it turns out. And that's what this hymn is encouraging us to do. This is the kind of narrative that Martin Luther uh, inherits uh, when in the 16th century uh, he, be, he begins what we refer to as the Lutheran Reformation. So I'm jumping to Luther now. Uh, Luther was a, an unusual uh, character. The uh, prominent musicologist Paul Henry Lang, uh, of the prominent musicologist of the 20th century, Paul Henry Lang and his rather monumental music in Western civilization. Speaks of Luther as a man who grew up with music ringing in his ears. And that's pretty true. Luther grew up as a young man. He went to the Latin school where the boys were instructed. Uh, he went on to the university. And in the course of that education, he, he studied the trivium, the quadrivium, which the trivium was grammar, rhetoric, logic, and the quadrivium were uh, uh, mathematics, geometry, astronomy, and music. Those were the seven liberal arts. And Luther often refers to these when he writes about music. And the first quote up there that I give on that sheet, where, music, where Luther talks about the purpose of music and what it, what's it for when we're talking about worship. He says, uh, let the, the, the words in music were only given to man so that he could praise God with both words and music, namely by proclaiming the word of God through music. And in that quote, Luther is saying, we were only given music and words so that God might be praised by using words and music in praise of God. And what is that praise of God? Namely, he says, by proclaiming the word of God. And by that, he's referring to that great narrative story of how God has acted to save mankind through history. And that's where it comes now. Now, that is a different view of uh, the role of music than many uh, other elders of the reformers had. He closely ties the role of music with the proclaiming of that message, proclaiming of that narrative. And I'll come back to that uh, uh, from time to time. But just hold that thought. And then I would just like to say a word.
which is probably the one that is even better known. And it seems all rather simple and rather correct when Luther says uh, that uh, of all the arts, he said, uh, uh, next to the word of God, I give music the highest praise. Well, that sounds, okay, we can all agree with that. It sounds, it sounds okay. Uh, think of it in this way. I think most people would interpret that in this way. When he says of all the arts, music is closely, most closely related to God's word. And he's thinking of it in this way. I think most people would say, if you had eight boxes, and uh, uh, one of the boxes said word of God, and the other said grammar, rhetoric, logic, astronomy, mathematics, music, did I miss one? Uh, all eight boxes, and ask them to stack them up in the right order. You'd say, well, Luther is saying, well, the word of God belongs in the top of the pile, and next to that is music. And then the rest underneath that. I think there's a, probably another way of thinking of that, which is, I think, a little more instructive. Because what Luther says is next to the Word of God. That's the phrase he uses. Now, what does that mean? If I would say, here are two boxes, one says Word of God, one says music, and I'd say, put those next to each other, what would you do? Pile them one on top of the other? No. You'd put them side by side. So that next to the Word of God, he gives music by his praise. Now, what he's saying there is that you don't really have two things when, when language and musical notes are joined together. You don't have language with some music attached, or, or you have music with some language attached. You have a third new thing, which is words and music together. And that is what Luther was talking about, and that is reflected in a common phrase which developed in the Reformation time, which spoke of music as the living voice of the gospel, the viva vox evangelii, the living voice of the gospel. In other, in other words, <clears throat> that the word, that the theology provides the substance, and music provides a vehicle which, when joined with that substance, becomes something which vivifies and brings to life the Word of God in a way that by itself is, it could not be done in quite the same way. Living voice of the Gospel. That is what Luther, spoke, that's how he spoke about the use of music. Always tied together with that overarching narrative story of how God acts to save his people. Uh, so much for those two quotes. And if you want to discuss those, we can discuss those later in the session that was announced. Uh, you have, uh, if, if you take the Reformation beginning in 1517 with the nailing of the 95 Theses upon the church, castle church door in Wittenberg, uh, six years later, you have Luther prompted by a lot of activity in worship uh, going on in the Reformation, much of which he disagreed with. And people were telling him, you've got to say something about this. What do you think about this or that? What are your views on this? And so in 1523, he published his Latin Mass. Well, it's maybe surprising to some that a reformer who is best known for his bringing worship into the vernacular, that his first publication about worship would be a Latin Mass. Uh, three years later, he publishes his German Mass in 1526. And in between those two, in 1524, there were two significant publications. The one was a little collection of hymns called the Ostleder Movement meaning a collection of eight hymns. Uh, that's what it's referred to uh, as. Uh, the actual title was Hitler Christian Cleaner, some Christian songs. There were eight of them. Uh, they didn't all have analogies attached. Some had just the words, but five of them had melodies. Just the melody uh, and with, with the words. And if you look at, the, at those hymns, and you look particularly at the first year. Now Luther is publishing, but Luther and his musical cohort, Johann Walter, are responsible for this publication. Well, you would expect that that first hymn would maybe have some significance, and it does. Uh, you have that first hymn on the handout. The hymn is Dear Christians, one 
It is the first hymn in the little collection of angels. And I just want to point out to you something of that hymn. What does it say? He is exhorting Christians to rejoice. It says, Dear Christians, one and all rejoice with exaltation ringing, and with united heart and voice and exaltation ringing I out the universe. What should they do? Proclaim the wonders God has done. How his right arm of the victory won so dearly it has cost him. Sometimes the translation that I'm saying is a little different because I learned it a few years ago and every hymnal kind of alters it a little bit, which irritates everybody, I think. But you get the idea. So he's saying Christians rejoice with heart and soul and with united heart and voice.
but it, it's on the text, Don Moriar Se Viva, which is the text, I shall not die but live and proclaim the works of the Lord. See, there's that proclamation emphasis again. Again and again, that is Luther's, uh, that is Luther's constant theme. That music is there to proclaim the good news of the gospel. That narrative of salvation. Uh, all right, so uh, just that's a little, just a little bit about Luther's own background. Uh, now let's say, uh, discuss a little bit about some of the hymns that came out of the early Reformation. And where did they come from? The situation at the time of the Reformation was, of course, not unlike the situation in this country after Vatican II, where the people had been told for centuries, don't sing. There's, there's not a place for that. And now Luther is encouraging them to sing. And in 1965 plus, the Pope said, sing. And now, well, what are we going to sing? Luther faced the same question. The first main source that Luther looked to for hymns for the people to sing was that large body of Gregorian chant, which had been the song of the church for 1,500 years from the beginning. Gregorian chant, remember, was sung in unison without a compliment, generally by monastic choirs. And over the centuries, it got more and more complicated, musically complicated. Luther grew up with that body of literature. He knew much of it. He had sung it by heart. He had sung it in the monastery. Uh, and he looked to that body of material as a source for what would become the people's song. And uh, what he did was two things. He took off of these Gregorian chants and he simplified them somewhat so that they would be more easily singable. Because much of the Gregorian repertoire had long grown to be very ornate uh, and long melismas in which one syllable would be extended over 5, 10, 15, 20 notes. And that would present some musical problems for an untrained group of singers. So he takes these chants and essentially makes them one note per syllable, with a few exceptions, but that was the idea, because then you have one note for every syllable, and that would be simpler to do. I'll give you an example. Uh, the, the chant Veni Redemptor Gentiles, which began, Veni Redemptor Gentiles, that's the first phrase. Uh, out of that, comes the, the tune, Savior of all nations, come. Can you hear the, the similarity in the, in the tune? It's essentially four notes. Uh, if you were to take four notes, four notes here, here. Songs like the 
Dory and Excelsis, the Kyrie Eleison, the, the, the uh, Cradle, the Son of the Alphabet State, uh, he wanted them to also be able to sing those. And so in the early Reformation, there grew up a, a body of hymns which were essentially like paraphrases of those five great songs of the Mass. And as paraphrases, they, uh, they were uh, usually the text was condensed in, in, in very private ways. Uh, most of the time, they were based musically on the Gordon chant. Uh, but they were simplified in that way. So that the idea was that people in singing these paraphrases were not singing like a poor man's version of the period because they couldn't sing to the, they couldn't handle the Gregorian chant or the Gloria. So we'll give them this to sing. But rather they were singing the Gloria and the Chelsea's, but in a in a with a text and in a musical idiom and a form that was more suited to their uh, capabilities and ability. He wanted them to sing the liturgy. How often have you been to church, to a church, where uh, at some point the choir gets up and then they sing something, and then the pastor, they sit down and the pastor says, let us now continue with the liturgy and unspokenness, which has been so unseemly interrupted by this horrible thing that we just heard. That was not what Luther was about. He wanted them to sing the liturgy or music integral to the liturgy. Okay, so the, the Gregorian chant was one of the first significant uh, resources upon which he drew for congregational song. The second one was uh, the group of songs that were called uh, Lysen. These were popular religious songs, each stanza of which ended with some form of the word of the phrase, Kyrie Eleison. Uh, an example would be a song like, uh, we, uh, it's a song, a song which we understand was sung by people as they went to the work in the fields when they came home, they would sing these songs. We now implore God the Holy Ghost for the true faith which we need the most that in our last hour he may befriend us and his homeward we journey attend us. Lord have mercy. And every stanza ended with Lord have mercy. So they were called lies. Uh, a third group of songs were what they called cantios. Cantios were uh, religious songs. Usually, uh, more often than not, they were in two languages that they alternated the text. Uh, probably the best known is in Dulce Nublo, which was a Latin phrase, immediately followed by the vernacular German, nun singe nun sei froh, in Dulce Nublo, nun singe nun sei froh. It was a very popular song. We know it as something like the Christian friends rejoice with all the soul of all the Lord. That was originally a uh, Pentios. He drew on that body of material. Uh, I'm going to jump to the fifth one, which was uh, newly written hymns. Uh, Luther wrote to a number of his uh, friends uh, that he thought might be able to uh, and be competent to write texts of new hymns. And in order to demonstrate to them what he had in mind, he wrote a good deal of the hymn texts himself. The one we looked at first year Christians, one of all rejoice, was a hymn by Martin Luther. And he encouraged them to do that. And so gradually, over the, the 16th century and in beyond, there grew a body of new hymns uh, which were added to that treasury of the church's song. <coughs> now I back up to that, that, that fourth category, uh, which was called contrafacto. Contrafacto were uh, secular songs, which were often simply taken over. The melodies were taken over. The secular lyrics were scratched out, and the religious lyrics written in. That was not an unusual custom. But one thing I want to make clear is that Luther only used it once. And having done it, he repented himself of the whole idea and, and decided, no, that's not a good idea. Uh, and the one time he used it was from the familiar hymn, from heaven above to earth I come. And he 
sent it to a secular tomb, and after a year or two, he said, came to the conclusion, no, he quit using that, and he wrote a different, an, an original tomb, uh, which is the one we know from. And again, note that first stanza. From heaven above to earth I come. This, this is the word of the, of the angel Gabriel announcing the birth of Christ. The angel is saying, From heaven above to earth I come to bear good news to every home. Glad tidings of great joy I bring, whereof I now will say and sing. In German, the phrase is singen und sagen, sing and say. In English, it says say and sing. Say and sing, sing and sign was essentially a phrase in which to say it was to sing it, to sing it was to say it. It was like one thing you did. You sing it and say it. Uh, and uh, so it, he's emphasizing again that we are singing this good news. And this is what the angel was proclaiming. Uh, it is true that in later, later in, in the 16th century, Others who followed Luther several generations on made for somewhat greater use of this idea of using secular tunes and putting religious words to them. Probably the, 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 most, the, the, the most familiar example would be in 1609, uh, 1601, uh, Hans Leo Hassler, who was a prominent composer of the time, uh, wrote a secular mandrill like piece. Uh, and the text was, Mein Gemeinde ist mir verwirrt, das macht ein Jungfrauenzart. Which is, it's, it's a song about a young man who has been rejected in love by this young lady, and now he's just at wit's end. He doesn't know what to do. He's all shook up, if I can use it. Uh, <laughs> and, and anyway, we, and we know the name of the, of the, of the lady who rejected him. Her name was Maria. How do we know that? Because the secular text was an acrostic, and the first letter of each of the five stanzas is spelled out M A R I A. Maria, we know that. Well, after about a, a good many years, that melody, the, the, well, I mean, I'll, I'll sing the first line, it's easier to recognize what it is, but the, the, the melody was, my Which becomes eventually, oh sacred and wounded, and you see that. But I, I would say this that the idea that one took immediately a, a really popular secular melody and overnight and put religious words to it and became all the rage, that was not the case. In most cases, these secular tunes had lost. The, the aura of secularity in the mind of the people generally. And by the time it appears as, oh, sacred dead now wounded, uh, it didn't seem to them that they didn't remember this was a secular melody to begin with. The reason I, I talked about this one is because in recent years it has been uh, very common, uh, certainly among Lutherans, but I think among Protestants generally. That every year about October, as you're approaching the Reformation, a lot of church magazines and church uh, publications, they'll appear with an article about how Luther took popular secular song from the, from the bars and the streets, and he made them into religious songs. And then the conclusion is drawn, therefore, we should do the same thing. And then, well, you know kind of what's happening. Lives of the body of literature like that. And we're singing religious lyrics to what everybody knows are secular songs with where the association is very obvious to them, is that? Uh, and I think I know part of the answer to why that is. The idea, of course, is to justify the existence of those for the people who write those songs. Uh, I think part of the reason for that is that uh, is a misunderstanding of the term. In the Reformation, many of the songs of the Reformation, in, certainly in the first hundred years, at least through the early 1600s, were written in a form that was called bar form. Well, where do you learn bar form? I guess you read it in the school. No, you don't. But it was called bar form. And it was simply a, a three-part form, A, A, B. 
And uh, as an example, if, uh, if you take, let's take the Hill of Mighty Fortress, uh, which is written in bar form. Here's the A section. Thank you. 
same is true of the, the, of the Epiphany hymn, How Lovely Shines the Morning Star, which uh, I'm more liberal. In, in, in what it was, was the various musical groups took 
don't turn into singing these dances. And the musical groups were, the first one was a congregation. The next one was a choir, if there was one. A uh, third one could be the organ. Uh, the one could be, uh, let's say, a brass ensemble, if you had, depending on what you had. And if you had only the congregation, you would alternate in whatever way you could. You could say, everybody sings one, men sing two, women sing three, everybody sings four, men sing five, women sing ten. Okay, so you were not singing all of the stanzas. And the point was that when you were not singing the stanzas, you obviously got the rest from singing. But you also had time to stop and meditate on the words which were being sung that you were hearing. And you could meditate on them in a way that you cannot always do when you are physically seeing that text. And it was called the alternation practice. And that, in one way or another, has come down to our time. And many of the congregations practice that in some way or other. And you do in your church as well. Uh, so that was one of the factors. Uh, okay, so Paul Gerhardt is now writing warmer hymns, more closely in touch with people's life situations. And uh, Paul Gerhardt, whose life spans the first three quarters of the 1600s, born in 1607, died in 1676, uh, uh, pretty much was in the run up to the period of time we call pietism. Pietism, these dates are arbitrary, but usually you say 1675 is, is a good starting place for when pietism started because one of the leading exponents of pietism, Philip Spainer, wrote a book called Pious Desires in 1675, which was uh, a gave impetus to the whole uh, movement. Oh my goodness. What, what, uh, what was going on in Pietism was more and more hymnody became more introspective. Uh, it was more, less about proclaiming, objectively proclaiming the good news of the gospel, and more and more concerned with how I feel about it, and things like that. And musically, what happened was, as I indicated, one thing that happened was the notes for the melody all were flattened out to be the same rhythm. So a mighty
following of their basic tradition, which was these original rhythmic chorales, which were sung in the Reformation. And you will, you will find those in much greater use in the Lutheran congregations today than you did, say, 50 years ago. And so that's, that's, that's the good news. Uh, there are many other things that can be said, and I would welcome if you have comments or, or whatever in the session later on, uh, which we'll have somewhere downstairs on the first floor. It's been a real honor and privilege to be with you, and thank you for your attention, and thank you for